Welcome to Jongets Games. Today we will be playing through a full three-player game of Mysthea the Fall. Now I will be teaching how to play this game while we are actually playing it, and I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because if any mistakes are made, I can then put corrections directly on the screen, and you should be able to see them. Now what's going on in this game is you have an interesting situation where Mysthea the Fall is a fully cooperative game, but in order to play it, you have to have the game Mysthea, which is competitive, and the game Icaon, which is also competitive. When you play Mysthea the Fall, you take pieces from both of those games and you pool them together, and then you have a fully cooperative experience where everybody is playing champions or seekers trying to defend the city in the middle of the map from the hordes of Mysthean enemies that are pouring out of the five floating islands that are no longer floating because they have now settled down onto the lands of Icaon. Now, all the while this is happening, there is a gigantic colossus which is wandering around the perimeter of the lands, and they seem to be sending all of these enemies towards the city, and I will explain how all of these details work when we are actually playing it. Now, before we jump into the game, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. You will find a variety of ways with which you could support the channel, and there are a few pretty cool perks there, including voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the game. Out here we have Mysthea the Fallen fully set up and ready to play. Now it's worth noting that since this game uses parts of Mysthea and parts of Icaon, well, the Mysthea pieces all come from the production shipped version, but the Icaon pieces all come from a prototype. That's why we have things like these little standees right here, and in fact this board and this event board down here are also prototype pieces. So uh, not everything you see will be exactly how it is in the final production version of Icaon, especially when you combine that with the production version of Mysthea. With all of that in mind, let's come over here to the three player areas, and normally in my playthroughs we play from the perspective of just one player, but since this is a fully cooperative game, we will effectively be playing as all three of these players, and it's worth noting that when you're playing Mysthea the Fallen, you are going to have half of the characters be champions from Mysthea, and the other half are going to be seekers from Icaon. Now when we're playing a three player game, that means we will have two and one, and the way we have this set up, we have a seeker up here, which is the Lone Ranger as the red player, and then down down here we have a seeker called the air and then lastly the blue player right here is Kolbor and Malabor who are uh, champions from Mysthea. So let's start playing and the Lone Ranger will begin things off. Now on a player's turn they will go through a day phase wherein they can take three actions from a pool of several options. Once they have taken three actions and they can choose the same action multiple times if they want, then we will go into a night phase where the monsters on the board will move, and then we will go back to a day phase where we then move on to the next player, and the second one in this case will be the blue player. That means the red player can start off with their day phase, which means they can start taking their three actions out here on the board. Now in order to figure out what they should do, we do need to know how we are going to win this game and potentially how we could lose it. Now the only way to win this game is to successfully investigate the gigantic Colossus five times. Now the Colossus is going to wander around the perimeter of the map, and in order to investigate the Colossus, we need to gather the Quom resources that match the color of the regions that are adjacent to that Colossus. Now unfortunately, whenever this Colossus moves, it will do damage to the city right here in the middle of the board. The amount of damage it does is going to be relative to the number of these little parasites that are out on the board, and the number of these big monsters that come into play occasionally. Now at the start of the game, the city has 100 health points, and we can track it up there with this shard, and we lose the game if that shard ever goes all the way around the board and hits zero. So we essentially don't want to take 100 damage to the city. Now there are other ways that we can lose if five of these monsters out here are able to come in and besiege these five spots on our city, then we will also lose, and you'll notice that as part of setup, we have two golems that are right here, and they are already threatening the city. Now I will explain the exact details of what happens when the Colossus moves and attacks the city once we actually get there, and I will also explain the details of the besieging mechanic once we get there. Now it is worth noting that there are two other ways that we can lose this game. If at any point any one of these five islands has no uh, monsters on it, then we immediately lose. And if at any point one player has all nine of their uh, machines out here on the board eradicated from regions, then we also lose. It's worth noting right now that you'll see over here that we have machines out here for players that aren't even in the game. We only have a red, a blue, and a yellow player right now, but you always play with all of the machines, including non-player characters, and in fact, we also have nine of these neutral buildings on the board as well. 
So the red player can now take their first out of three actions, and while it seems like we definitely want to try and defeat some of these monsters, I think the first action they should do is deposit Quom into the city. Now, any of these Quom resources in the city are effectively shared resources. Any player can use them during their turn when they are spending Quom, and every player can only hold six Quom at any one point in time. Now, I do think the red player is going to be traversing out, and they have the potential of hitting their six cap on their next turn. So I figure the first thing they will do is deposit. Now, you can only do this when you are at a node that is adjacent to the city, and we can see there are five different spots that can hold these resources. So the red player has decided they're going to take both of these starting resources they have, and they'll put them down right over here. And now in the future, they could use these on their turn, and both of their uh, partners could also use these as if they were in their own personal reserves. Red has now finished their first action, but before they take their second action, they have decided they want to take one of the two free action options available to them on their turn. Now the first of these options is they could use their relic, they could flip that over and use the special ability for their character, but they've decided they don't want to do that just yet. But the other thing that they can do in addition to using their relic is once per turn they could activate one of the machines in a region next to the node that they are at. Now we can see they do happen to start in a region with three of their machines, and there's always one of each of the three types of machines in these regions. This right here is a harvester, then we have a scavenger, and then finally this is a refiner. Now, when you activate the machine, it does its ability. If you activate a harvester, you will get one Quom resource equal to the color of the region. So that would be one white if that's what red did. This scavenger right here allows a player to put a fortification token down into a node that is adjacent to that region. And lastly, this refiner allows the player to immediately defeat any one monster in this region. Now, considering there are two of these golems in the region and they are tougher than the troops, it looks like it makes sense for red to do that. So they will activate their refiner and immediately defeat this golem. Now, whenever you defeat any number of monsters with an action, you then have to put all of them down onto a single island that is around the map. Now, this is important because, again, we lose the game if any island has no monsters on it. And if we ever have to deploy monsters from an island during the night phase and there aren't enough, then we will start taking extra damage to our city. With that in mind, I figure let's put this golem right back over here. There were only two, so now we have three, and we're just spreading things out well. Red can now take their second action, and they have decided to move. Now, moving is pretty simple. You just follow one of these roads right here to the next node, and that uses your full move action. Now, if you move for your first action of the day phase, then you do get a bonus move. You can go one or two with that. However, for the first action, we decided to deposit these Quom Crystals, so now we can only move to one spot. Now, it is worth noting that if you move onto a location where one of your partners is at, then you must go to another spot. You can never have two of these characters on the same location. This means we can strategically try to put ourselves into places to be able to move really fast by going onto a spot where our partners are at, and it's worth noting that this is the reason why fortifications exist. You can put these out again if you activate your scavenger right here. And when you go onto a region with any player's fortification, you could stay there. Or for a free bonus, you could then move to another adjacent location. Now, in this case, we obviously cannot put a fortification down because you can only activate one building per turn. And we activated our uh, refiner right here. So for this action, we're going to go right over here. And then for our third action of the day phase, I think let's move again, going right over to here. Now, you may be wondering why we used our final action to go right over here. And the reason for that is because we now want to do our other free action of the turn where we can use our relic. Now, at the start of the game, we have it on this refreshed side, so we can now flip this over as a free action, and then do the special bonus action for the Lone Ranger. Down here, you can see these little icons, and what it says is we can defeat one uh, enemy from each uh, adjacent region to the node we are at, and we are now over on the spot adjacent to three regions, each of which have one enemy in them. So in that case, we can now defeat this golem, as well as this troop here and this troop. So we have done a really good job using our free actions to take care of a lot of these monsters that were threatening the city. As I mentioned before, whenever you defeat any number of enemies with an action, you have to respawn all of them back to the same island. And I think we should choose this one right here because it is so low on troops. Now the reason for that is because as part of setup, we did draw one random monster, and that ended up being Cinnabarok. There are seven monsters total, and every single one of them has a special ability, and Cinnabarok's ability is it appears on an island and then takes half of the troops on that island and puts them down on top of their card. 
And what that means is it's going to be harder to keep the island with Cinnabarak on it uh, fully uh, stocked up with these troops. And that is important because if we ever have to deploy troops from one of these areas and there aren't enough, then we will take damage to the city. So we can now uh, go ahead and respawn over here, putting both of these troops down. And this does mean we have to put this golem over here. There already were four, so now there are five golems in this spot. And it's worth noting that there are five islands and five different region types. So each of the region types has one island with golems on that region. All right, the red player has finished out their day phase, which means we can now go into their night phase. And all we do for this is draw the top one of these event cards, and then we evaluate it. In this case, it looks like we have found a Colossus card, and there are three of these within this deck. Now, whenever these Colossus cards are drawn, we are then going to move the Colossus, and then all of the Colossus's allies will attack the city. The first thing that happens is the Colossus will spawn one Parasite into each of the adjacent regions that it is at. And again, these come with Ikeon, so they are prototype placeholder pieces for those Parasites. Next up, the Colossus and their allies will attack, and the Colossus specifically controls all of the Parasites on the board, and that means that every Parasite will do two damage to the city. At the moment, there are just two Parasites out here, so that means the city will take four damage, and that means it will go from 100 down to 96, and then all of the allies of the Colossus attack, and that means these monsters that are out here on the board. Fortunately, we just have one monster at the moment, and it is Cinnabarok, and they will do damage equal to their strength value, so that means Cinnabarok right here will do 7 damage to the city, and we will then go from 96 down to 89, and just like that, we have already lost 11% of the city's life total. Lastly, the Colossus will move, and the way that works is we reach right in here into this bag, and the number on this shard tells us how many nodes the Colossus moves to. Now the Colossus always goes to the exterior nodes that just have two adjacent regions. So in this case, they will move twice, and that means they will go right here for one, and then all the way down here for two. Uh, these are on the outside of the board, but they are only adjacent to one region, which is why they don't count. So the Colossus is now all the way down here, and we can now leave this primal shard right over there to show that it is out, and then put the bag down, and we have now finished out this Colossus action. The night phase is now over, so the blue player can now go into their day phase, and for their first out of three actions, they have decided they want to move. Now, as I said before, when you move as your first action, you could go one or two spaces instead of the normal one, and they've uh, started the game right up here, so they're going to move one, two spaces just like that. At this point, they have decided for a free action, they do want to activate one of their machines. They are at a node that is adjacent to a region with their machines in it, and they're going to activate this harvester right here. Now, this is another one of the pieces that come from Ikeon, so obviously this is a uh, prototype piece right here. And the harvesters will give the player one crystal of the colored region that it is in. So in this case, they can grab one of these pink crystals and put that into their supply. For their second action, they are going to move once again, and for their third action, they want to investigate this Colossus right here. Now, in order to investigate the Colossus, you need resources that match the two regions that are currently adjacent to the Colossus. We can see right now the Colossus is next to white as well as pink. Now, we know that there is one white resource in the city in the middle, so that is a shared resource which the blue player can use, but they don't think they have enough resources at the moment. Now, the main way that you gather these resources is you can spend your main action to do a collect action. When you do that, you simply grab one crystal for each of the regions that you are adjacent to. So if the blue player did that right now, they would get a pink, a white, and a brown, but that would be their third and final action, and they would not have any actions left over to investigate this Colossus. Because of that, because before they take their main action, they're going to do their other free action, which involves using their relic. They can flip this over to exhaust it, and that will allow them to do the special ability right down here. Now that simply says they can take three resources of any color of their choice, so what they have decided to take is a pink and two white. So they can add these over here into their uh, supply, and now for their third and final action, they are going to investigate the Colossus. Now the first thing the blue player has to do is choose one of these five primal shards that are shoved into the base of this Colossus. Now that shard will have a 1, a 2, or a 3 printed on it, and that will tell the blue player how many pairs of pink and white resources they have to spend in order to successfully investigate the Colossus. Now if they pulled a 1, then that would just cost uh, 1 pink and 1 white, but if they pulled a 3, they would have to have 3 pink and 3 white, and that's why they really wanted to play their turn out this way, so they have 3 pink here, and then 1, 2, 3 white, 
white available to them. If they uh, pulled out a three and they did not have enough resources, then they would not have to spend the resources, but they would not be successful with this investigate action, and it would effectively be lost. So in this case, they have guaranteed that they will uh, succeed. They, of course, had to spend some resources to do that, and they're going to go ahead and pull this shard out first. Now we can take a look at it, and it has a 1 on it, <laughs> so uh, they certainly kind of went overkill right here. They're definitely not going to be using this communal resource over here, and this means they can simply get rid of one pink and one white, because again, those are the colors that are adjacent to where the Colossus is right now, and then the blue player can take the shard and put it in front of themselves. Now this is important because the only way we win the game is by successfully investigating the Colossus five times, and we are only going to win as long as every single one of the players has investigated at least once. So we can track that by putting this right over here, and it's also worth noting that as part of the difficulty level for the game, we are playing on a normal game, and that is going to dictate the number of ones, twos, and threes that are uh, available. There are only two ones that are available, and we've pulled one of them out. There are four twos and four threes. We only uh, randomly pulled five out from this bag, so as we dig through this more, we will have a better idea of how many threes might actually be lodged uh, into the base of this miniature, but just like that, we have completed one fifth of the things that we need to do in order to win the game. The last thing that has to happen is whenever a player is successfully able to investigate the Colossus, they have to warp back to one of the five nodes that are surrounding the city, and the blue player has decided they're just going to go right back over here, and with that they have taken their three main actions, and they have also done both of their available free actions, so they have finished out their turn, and we can now go into a night phase. So we can draw the top card from the event deck, and we have found a region card. This is for the pink crystal fields, and we can then put this right down over here onto this event board. Now at this point, I do want to mention that since we are playing with the Icaon event board, there are some symbols on this board and on some of these cards that we aren't actually using when we are playing Mystia the Fall. Uh, those are used when you're just playing the base game of Icaon. Now in this case, once we put this down over here, we can look out to the rest of the cards that have been revealed. Now if we had revealed uh, a mountain or a forest or one of these Land of Mist cards, then we would be doing something else, but since this is different than all of those types, this is going to get put down right here, and we will now do an Assault action on the board. Now the first phase of an Assault involves finding the inner region that matches the color of this card. So that's going to be this pink region right down here, and then we look to all of the exterior regions that are adjacent to this targeted inner region, and each one of those regions will send one enemy troop into the crystal field. If there are uh, troops as well as golems, then we would send the golems first, but fortunately for us, there are no troops or golems in any of these fields right here. It's worth noting that the parasites will never actually move, so we don't have to move anything over here that worked out pretty well for us and now the second thing that happens is we look to the location of the Colossus and then we find the two islands that are adjacent to it. Now we will find the region on those islands that matches the color of this card and we can see this island has a pink region but fortunately this island does not have a pink region and then each of those islands with a matching region is going to send one figure out onto an adjacent location. So in that case, we're going to send this golem right over here, and this golem's going to go right down over here. And if by doing this we did not have enough golems to place out, if we had one or zero over here, then we would have taken five damage to our city. So this is another big reason why we want to keep these islands filled up. Blue is now done with their night phase, which means the yellow player can now take their day phase. For the first action, the yellow player wants to move, and that means they actually get to move twice because that is the bonus for moving with your first action. Now with the first of these moves, they will go right here, and that means they've landed on a node with one of their partners, and that means they get a bonus move again, so they can go right here with that, but they still have one more move available to them, so they can now go over here, and they got all the way over here with just one action. Next up, they are going to activate one of their machines as a free action, and they've decided to go with this refiner right here, because again, that allows them to defeat any one enemy in that region, so that's going to kill this golem right here. And then I figure, let's just respawn them right back to the island they came from. For their second main action, they're going to go right over here. And for their third main action, they've decided it's now time to attack. Now, when you do an attack action, you can target any one of the regions that are adjacent to your character. And in this case, they're going to target this Land of Mist area to try and take out this golem. Now, the way attacking enemies works is a player can spend one, two, or three of these Quom crystals that match the color of that area. Now we can see the yellow player has one of them in their personal supply, and we still have one over here in the city which they could use. 
Well, I think we should start by having them spend their personal crystal, and it's important to note that even though you can spend one, two, or three, you actually don't have to decide how many you're going to spend at the start of this combat. Instead, you just go one at a time, and for every crystal you bring over here, you will then draw a card from the top of the appropriate command deck. The first crystal that you uh, bring over is going to reveal a card from the arrow 1 command deck. If you pay a second crystal, then you can then reveal one from the 2 deck, and then a third crystal would reveal a card from this level 3 deck. Now you can never spend more than 3 crystals, and you can never draw more than one card from each one of these decks, and each one of these cards has a number on it. Uh, the highest value for the 1s is a 3, the highest value for the 2s is a 4, and the highest value for the 3s is a 5, but there are 1s, 2s, and 3s amongst all 3 of these decks. So with this in mind, we can put this right over here and draw the top from the arrow 1 deck. And when we flip it over, we see a 3 in the top left corner. So we actually hit the highest value for this deck. Now, these are uh, technically components from the base game of Mysthea. And because of that, when we are playing Mysthea the Fall, we only pay attention to the color of the banner and the number in the top. These icons down at the bottom are only used in the base game of Mysthea. So we can put this right over here, and we have now generated three combat points. And in order to defeat these golems out on the board, we only need to spend two combat points. So right from the get-go, we have successfully defeated this golem. And at this point, if we wanted to, we could keep spending our resources to increase the number of combat points we have. But I just don't think that makes sense, because we already have enough. So let's now come back to the board and divvy out those strength points that we got from the command cards. In this case, we have three strength points total, and as I mentioned, each golem is only going to take two strengths to defeat. Now, whenever you divvy out these strength points, you have to always defeat golems first if there are any, and then you can start working on the troops. Now, these troops only take one strength point to defeat, and once all of the troops are gone, you can defeat the parasite cubes, and those only take one strength as well. In this case, there was just one golem right here, so they spend two out of their three strength, and that will defeat this golem. And now we have a special bonus, because whenever you finish out a combat, you've eradicated everything from a region, and you have one or more strength left over, then you get an eradication bonus. Now the way these eradication bonuses work is you come back over here to all of the command cards that were revealed, and you choose one of them and get a bonus based off of the color of that card. Now in this case, the yellow player just revealed one card, and it has a red banner, and that means they could do the red eradication bonus. In this case, what that lets them do is defeat any one of those little troop miniatures anywhere out on the board. However, if we take a look in here, and if we had had a green as an option, then the eradication bonus for this is we could move one troop or one golem from any region uh, to one of the adjacent regions on the board. Another of the options is a blue bonus. The blue one would allow us to take one crystal of any color and give it to any player, uh, not necessarily ourselves. And then the other bonus is the yellow one. If you do a yellow eradication bonus, then you can move any character to an adjacent location. Now, in this case, we just had the option of red, and that's pretty good. As I said before, this will allow us to defeat any one troop from anywhere on the board for that eradication bonus, because again, we had more strength than we needed to eradicate everyone from the region that was being attacked. Right now, there are just two of these troop enemies out on the board, so let's defeat this one for that eradication bonus, and then we have to respawn all of the enemies that were defeated into one of the islands, and I figure let's go right up here. It only had three golems, so now it has four, and then we can put this troop right down over here, bringing it from two up to three. At this point, the yellow player has taken all three of their main actions, and they could technically use their relic if they wanted to. Looking down at their card, we can see their Relic Special Ability lets them take three Quom Crystals from their personal supply and immediately put them into the city for the common supply. At the moment, they just have one crystal though, so it does not make sense for them to use this just yet. And if they did, it would of course become exhausted. And this will only become unexhausted once we have revealed one of each of the five different region uh, cards during the night phases. The other way this can be flipped over is there is one card in this deck called the Storm. And I'll explain how that works once we actually see it. But for now, it looks like the yellow player is going to finish their turn. They'll leave this on the refreshed side so they can potentially use it on their next turn. And now we can go into their night phase. The way this works is we once again draw the top card from the event deck, and we have found a forest region card. Now looking out to the, all of the cards that we've revealed already, we see that we do already have a forest revealed. This means we can put this right over here, and it's important to note that there are just two of each of the region types in this event deck. So we've pulled both of the forest cards out. This first one came out as part of setup. All three of these did because we're playing a normal uh, game. And whenever you pull the second and last of that type of region out, 
out, we will now have an invasion for that region type. The way invasions work is pretty simple. We are going to look out to these five islands, and we will notice that three of them have a region that matches the color of the region card we just pulled out. Well, all three of those islands will release enemies onto their two adjacent spots from those regions. That means we can start down here, and we have a forest region down here. There are these two adjacent areas, so that means a troop will get put down into both of those. Over here, we have golems in the forest region, so that means this one will be deployed over here, and this one will go over here. And then lastly, this top island also has a green region with three troops in it. It's going to put one enemy into each of its adjacent regions. So we'll put this one here, and this one will go over here. After that invasion from these islands, there are a lot more enemies out on the board, and that is going to finish out the night phase after the yellow player's turn. So now the red player can take their day phase. Well, I think to start out, their first action is going to be a collect action, and this means that they get to take one quome crystal that matches the color of each of their adjacent regions. We can see right now they're next to pink, blue, and white, so they can take all three of those crystals, and then they can add them into their personal supply. And then for their second action, I think it makes sense for them to collect again. They are now at their maximum of six crystals in their area, which means red has one action remaining, and I think they should attack enemies in this pink crystal field area. They can start off by using one of their pink crystals, and this will allow them to draw from the command decks, although unlike normal, where they would draw a level 1, their ongoing special ability is now going to come into effect. We can see right up here that whenever they do an attack, they actually start with the level 3 stack, and then their second crystal brings out a 2, and the third crystal brings out a 1. So the Lone Ranger essentially goes backwards when it comes to attacking, so uh, right from the get-go, they have the potential of doing a lot more damage, because again, the max number of strength is 5 for these level 3s, and just 3 for these level 1s. So we can start off by revealing the top card, and it is a 3. And when we come back to the board and we consider the fact that there's just one troop and one parasite out here, and each of those takes one strength, then that three is more than enough, and that means we will get an eradication bonus. So let's stop drawing those command cards and start dealing out the strength. We have to start with golems, but there aren't any. That means we can then spend one of our three strength to eradicate this troop, and then our second out of three to eradicate this parasite. We now have one strength left over, so we can do an eradication bonus. And it looks like our only option is a green bonus, which lets us move a troop or a golem to an adjacent area. It is worth noting that if we wanted to, we could keep spending more of those crystals to deal out more of these cards, even if we already had enough strength, just to give ourselves more options for the various eradication bonuses. But for now, I don't think that makes sense. Now, there are a few different options for this bonus, but I think let's take this golem and move them into this adjacent forest area. That way, we could be a little bit more action efficient with eradicating multiple enemies with one action, and this is pretty close to two of the player characters. Now, at this point, I do want to mention uh, how attacks work. I haven't talked about this just yet, but normally, when you move a third enemy figure into a region, so in this case, if another one went down into here, then an attack would happen immediately, and that is how these machines get destroyed out on the map. If a region has all three machines, then the first one to get destroyed will be a Harvester. If there are just two machines, then the second one to be destroyed will be a Scavenger. And finally, if there are just one machine here, then with, uh, that's how the refinery will be taken out. If an attack ever happens on a region that has no machines, then we will take five more damage to the city over here. And the reason I'm talking about that right now is because with this eradication bonus, if we had moved this over into an area so that there were three or more, we would not actually have an attack because this bonus is a nice way to sneak around that. As it is, we're not quite to the point now where that attack might happen, but by grouping these up, we are making it slightly more possible. So we become more action efficient, but we are also pushing our luck a little bit because we don't really want our machines to get destroyed because the less of them out there means the less options we have for our free actions on our turns, and of course, if they all get destroyed, then we take more damage to the center area. The last thing we have to do for this attack action is to respawn the enemies. However, whenever you destroy these parasites, they don't get put out onto islands. Instead, you put them over into the player's area. Now, whenever you spend the Quome Crystals to do anything, you can actually discard a Parasite as if it was a Wild Crystal. So destroying these Parasites is really good because it means we take less damage when the Colossus moves, and they act as Wild Crystals, which works out really well. It's also worth noting that whenever you spend these Quome Crystals, you can spend two of the same color as if it was one of any other color, so that's an extra thing to keep in mind. And it's worth noting that this uh, Parasite right here does not count towards your maximum six Crystals you can hold. 
You could only have two parasites at any one point in time, but you could hypothetically have two parasites and six crystals, which is just a lot of resources. So we can put this parasite right over here for the uh, red player, and it is worth noting you can never deposit these parasites into the middle of the city. The red player has to be the one to spend this. Now we do have this one troop right here that does have to get respawned, and I figure let's put it right up here. There is just one in that area right now, and that was starting to worry me. At this point, the red player has done all three of their main actions, but they are adjacent to a region with their buildings, and so they do want to use them. And they've decided to activate their scavenger right here to deploy one of their three fortifications. They figure they're probably going to be heading this way on their next turn, so they will put the fortification right here so that they will get a bonus movement with this down, and it will stay there for the rest of the game. Red is done with their turn, so we can now go into their night phase, and the next of these event cards is a mountain. That is the second of the mountains, which means each of the islands with mountains will now do an invasion. Just like before, we can look out to find the three islands with the matching type. That's going to be mountains down here, mountains right over here, and mountains at the top. This means we're going to take two of the uh, enemies from this mountain region. They're going to go into the adjacent regions. Over here, that is going to be troops again going into this crystal field and this forest. And then up here, we are going to have a golem go into this crystal field and a golem go over here into this mountain range. There are now three of these enemies in this area, which means, unfortunately, they are now going to attack. Just like I explained before, whenever there is an attack in a region, a machine will be destroyed. Uh, the first one to go will always be the harvester, then the scavenger, and then finally the refinery. And I have put these out on the board so we can just go from the left to the right. That means that this green harvester is destroyed. And green was the non-player character, so it uh, doesn't really affect our ability to do actions. But it is worth noting that, of course, if all three of these are gone and another attack happens, we will still lose five health for the city. So we still want to pay attention to the non-player character machines out on the board. All right, that night phase is done, which means blue can now take their day phase. And I think it makes sense for them to once again try and investigate this Colossus. Since there are still four of these shards we have to try and get, and three players, that means they could potentially take two of these shards before we find ourselves in trouble. Because again, every one of us has to uh, investigate one of these shards. So if Blue is able to get two of them right now, then they won't be able to investigate the Colossus for the rest of the game. We'll have to have the other players prioritize that. But then Blue could really focus on dealing with other concerns out on the board. Right now, they still have pink and white in front of themselves, so they are pretty well uh, positioned to do this. So for their first action, they're going to move. That's going to make them go 1-2 because they again get a bonus movement since this is their first action. For their second move, uh, or second action, they have decided they are going to collect. Now we can see they're next to pink, white, and brown. However, if we look at their card, they have an ongoing bonus that says whenever they do a collect action, one of the crystals that they take can actually be any color that they want. It does not actually have to match the region that they are pulling from. So because of that ability, they are going to take a pink and a white, but this brown will turn into a white, so they now actually have too many crystals in their area, but they do have three pink and three white in their personal area to uh, make sure they can succeed at investigating the Colossus without using any of these communal resources. Now, the moment you have more than six uh, crystals in your area, you have to immediately discard down. So they're just going to get rid of this green right here, leaving them with the optimum set for this investigation, and now they will do that action. Just like before, they have to take one random shard, and they'll keep working from the back right here. We can see this one has a one on it. <laughs> We've hit both of the ones. Uh, well, it looks like the blue player was way over prepared for this. We can put this right down here, and they have to spend a pair of pink and white. Just one pair, and these will go to the bank. And we have now successfully done two out of the five investigations we need to win. But unfortunately, the blue player, who is probably best able to actually get the crystals together, uh, did it really easily. And it's going to be a lot harder for the rest of us to get the ones we need. And we do not have the bonuses that match up to it. Now, while we are talking about these bonuses, we may as well talk about the yellow players. This one says that whenever they use a parasite, they can get two uh, wild crystals out of it instead of the regular one. So with that in mind, we definitely do want the yellow player to try and take out some of those parasites because that will make it much easier for them to investigate the Colossus. Uh, the red player is much better at destroying enemies out on the board, so perhaps we'll try to have the yellow player be one uh, to get two out of these three. And then, of course, the red player does have to do at least one of these, and it really would have been better if one of those had been a one, but this is the way that things shook out for us.
Now the last thing Blue does have to do after they have finished this investigation is move back to one of these nodes around the city, although I just realized that they will be moving away from a region that is uh, our node next to a region with their buildings. So let's just say before they did this investigation, if they noticed that, they certainly would have used their refinery and that would have taken out this troop right here. Um, we certainly would have done that. I was just so excited to do this uh, investigation. I cleared, cleared right over it. So we'll just uh, fix that mistake. We'll say they use this refinery. We'll just put this troop right back over here. Uh, that all happened before they investigated and now they have to move to a node next to the city and let's put them right over here. Uh, there are quite a few uh, enemies up here and the blue player is now probably much more uh, about trying to take out enemies and we do want to deal with these before they get too much worse. Blue is done with her turn, so we can now go into a night phase where we draw the top event card, and we have found the storm card. Now, there are just one of these in this event deck, and when the storm happens, we are going to reveal another monster, and this is the moment when monsters might besiege the city. Technically, we don't even put the storm card over here. We instead put it over here because the first thing we do is draw another monster card, and we have to spawn it onto the board. Now, we have found... Kerulus right here, and this little icon is going to dictate which island this monster will spawn onto. Now we can figure that out by looking at the rules. This little symbol right here means this is the island where the monster will go, and that matches up with this island here. So we can come over here to the miniatures and find the matching one for this monster. That's a pretty cool double spirit crazy thing right there. And now the special ability for this monster will come into play. Now it's pretty simple for Kerulus here. All this means is until this monster is defeated, we cannot do any more investigation actions on the Colossus. So the only way we can win the game has been stalled out while this monster exists. So it's now a much higher priority for us to destroy this monster. And I haven't talked exactly about how we do that just yet, but I'm sure it'll happen soon considering this one is stopping us from getting closer to winning the game. So this monster will go right here onto this island, and it is worth noting that the monsters never leave the island, so if we want to fight them, we have to come over to a node that is adjacent to the island and do that attack. The next thing we do for a storm action is looking to the board to see if the city gets besieged. Now we look to all of the five inner regions, and if any of them have a troop in it, then they will send one troop into the middle of the city, occupying one of these five spots. Once a troop is onto one of those locations, we can no longer store any crystals on it, and there is no way to remove those troops from these locations. So if this happens five times, this is one of the ways that we can lose the game. But fortunately, we have done a pretty good job of clearing out all of the monsters from these inner regions, so we don't have any monsters join in over here. So no besieging happens for us, and there is just one of these storm cards in the deck, so uh, we uh, were able to have the board in a good game state for this to come out. The last thing that happens with a storm action is every player can now refresh their relics. So uh, the yellow player didn't actually use theirs, but the blue player did and the red player did. So we now have access to those three actions again. The night phase is now over, so the yellow player can take their day phase. Now I think the first thing they should do is a collect action. They are currently next to brown, white, and green areas. So they can add all of these into their personal supply. And then let's have them use their free machine action, and that will be this refinery. That allows them to defeat any enemy in this area, and we can just have them destroy this golem right here. And then they're going to send it to be respawned down onto this island. At this point, they still have two actions, and they have decided to attack this land of mist. There's just one troop over here, so they only need one strength to destroy it. And they're going to start off by, of course, spending one white crystal to begin this attack. They, of course, start with a level 1 era command card, and they found a 1. So we can put this right over here, and they do have enough strength to destroy that troop. Unfortunately, they don't have any extra. Now, they could use the one uh, white crystal from the communal pool in order to draw another card. Uh, this would come from the second pool, and that would allow them to do an eradication bonus. But they don't think that's particularly worth it right now. They're just going to go ahead and allocate this one strength, which will kill off this troop. Now they could respawn it on any island, but they're just going to put it right down here, and that's going to finish out that action. But they still have one action left, and they have decided to collect crystals once again. This means they get another brown, green, and white, and now they've finished out their main actions, but they do now want to use their relic. Unfortunately, the storm just came out refreshing these. Uh, they would have liked to use this earlier, but oh well, they're going to flip this over, and their relic ability says they can immediately put three of their crystals into the communal pool up here. Uh, right now, there is a green and a white out there, so I figure let's put a brown and a blue so we have a nice variety. And then from these ones that are left over, Let's go ahead and put a white down into there. 
Actually, I'm going to change my mind on that. It seems pretty obvious the blue player is wanting to do something about this brown region up here, which means they will need brown crystals, so let's put this brown in there instead. Yellow's turn is done, so we can do their night phase, and we have found the second out of three Colossus cards in this event deck. Just like the first time a Colossus card came out, they are going to spawn two Parasites. One is going to go into each of the adjacent regions, and then the Colossus will attack as well as the allies. When the Colossus attacks, we will take two damage to the city for each Parasite on the board. That's going to be one, two, three times two. That means we are going to take six damage, and then the allies are these two monsters over here. If we look at their cards, we can see that is going to be 7 plus 6, or 13 more damage. So 13 plus that 6 from the Parasites means we are taking 19 damage right now. And that's a pretty big deal. I think we have been ignoring these monsters a bit too much. We really have to take them out as well as these Parasites. Otherwise, we will lose the game when the city takes 100 damage. Well, with this devastating attack, we go from 89 down to 70. And we're still in an okay position, but we've already lost 30% of the health of the city. At this point, the Colossus now wants to move, and the way we do that is by pulling a random shard from this bag, and we have found another two. Uh, again, when we play a normal game, we pulled out four twos, four threes, and two ones. We randomly put them in the bag and then pulled five of them out to lodge into the base without looking at those numbers. So this gives us a little bit more intel about what might still be lodged into the base of that Colossus, and either way, this means the Colossus will move twice around the board. Just like before, they always walk to the next node that is adjacent to two regions between these islands, so that will be one movement and then two movement over here. Well, that completes the yellow player's night phase, so now the red player can take their day phase. Well, when it comes to figuring out their turn, I think we need to have the red player try to defeat this monster. Though those monsters are really chewing through the defense of the city when the Colossus moves, and the Lone Ranger is able to be much more efficient with their command cards to their crystals. They get to draw the level 3s before the 2s and the 1s, so they will get a lot more bang for their buck compared to their partners. But before we move, I think we should have the red player do a free action. They are right next to a region with their machines, and they're about to move away from that region. So let's go ahead and have them activate their harvester right here, and that will get them one crystal of the color of the region. So they get to grab a white chrome crystal. Next up, they are going to take their first action, and since it will be a move, that means they get a bonus movement. That means they can go twice, and with the first move, they are going to land on the fortification they built last round, which means they get yet another bonus move. Uh, they will use that, which brings them to here with just one of their two movement, and then with the second one, they'll go adjacent to this island. With their second action, they have decided they now want to attack Canabarok, the monster on this island. Now again, you can only attack monsters if you are on a node that is adjacent to the island, and the way attacking works is pretty similar to attacking the enemies out on these regions. Now when you fight the enemies, you have to discard crystals that match the color of that region, but when you fight the monsters, you simply have to discard crystals that match one of the three colors of the island over there. So you are actually much more flexible when you need to uh, get rid of those crystals. However, in order to be successful, we need to at least meet the strength of this monster. So we do have to get to seven. Now we can spend the white, the pink, or the blue crystals to do this. And they currently have three of these white crystals, so they're going to start with that. Now, they are the Lone Ranger, which means instead of drawing from the first era deck, they can actually begin by going from this third era. We can flip this over, and they got a two. Now, we can put this right here, and obviously two is not good enough to get to seven, so we can now choose to get rid of another crystal. And let's use another one of their white crystals to draw a level two card. In this case, we found a 1, and this is looking really bad for us. We have 2 plus 1, or 3, and again, we know that in this deck, the highest uh, value we could possibly get to is a 3. So there is no conceivable way for us to successfully defeat the monster with this action. We just drew really low, unfortunately, and that means I think we should just stop. This means we have to discard both of these crystals. We do not get them back, and both of these cards will be discarded as well, so I guess it's good that we have these out of the pool, but that certainly did not go well. We lost an action as well as two crystals and got nothing for it. Fortunately for us, the red player does have one more action, and there are a bunch of crystals in the middle they could use, and they still have two blues, a pink, and a white. So I think for their third action, they're going to try and attack that monster again. This time around, they're going to start with a blue crystal, and they will once again go to the third deck first because they are the Lone Ranger, and they have found a four, so right away this is starting off better. Obviously, we are not at seven yet, so they do have to discard another one of those crystals, and they're going to get rid of another one of these blue ones. They are currently next to a blue region, so they could get more of them if they want to, and now they're really hoping to see a three or a four, and they got a four. 
awesome. This works out really well for us because actually we have eight to the seven, and that means that we have more strength than we need to defeat this monster, and that's going to get us an eradication bonus. Now I am getting a little ahead of myself. Let's stop drawing those cards now and divvy out our eight strength. Seven of that will destroy Kanabarak, and the special ability for this monster grabbed half of the troops from this region. Now, whenever you defeat this monster, that means all of these troops will come back to this region. So let's go ahead and put two right over here, and then two right over there. Now is the time when we officially get that eradication bonus, because we have eliminated the monster, and we have at least one strength left. So let's come back to the command cards we revealed, and we could choose the yellow eradication bonus, which lets us move any one of the characters to an adjacent node, or we could do the red eradication bonus, which allows us to defeat one troop from anywhere on the map. Those two bonuses give us a lot of different options, but I figure we'll go with the red eradication bonus to destroy a troop from anywhere, and we'll pull this one. Uh, we could put that right over here if we want to. We could choose any of the islands, I suppose. But the reason to do this is because we know that as soon as the Colossus moves again, they will put Parasites down into each of these spots. Parasites are enemies, so that would be the third enemy in this region if we had left it there, and that would cause an attack which would destroy one of our machines, which we certainly don't like. With that, the red player is done with their day phase, so we can now go to their night phase, and we'll draw the top event card, and we have found the first of the water region type of cards. Now, when we put this down right over here, we can see that we have shown all five of the different types. We have mountains, forests, land of mist, the crystal fields, and finally the rivers over here. Now, once this happens, that is actually going to cause us to shuffle all of these cards back into the deck. But before we do that, we do have to fully evaluate this. This is the first of that type of card to come out, which means we are going to have a river region assault. The first thing we do is find the matching inner region, and that will be right here, and it will pull in one enemy from every one of the adjacent outer regions. Now we can look over here, and we see there are two troops and one golem, and when there are troops and golems, you always move the golem first, so the golem will go down here. Over here in this forested area, there is one troop, so they will move down, and then fortunately in this red area, there aren't any uh, golems or troops. These parasites are technically enemies, but they never actually move. Now this is a bit scary when you consider the fact that we are about to shuffle this storm card back into the event deck, and if this was to come out while there are any enemies here, they will besiege the city and take up one of the five slots. Again, that is one of the several ways we can lose if five enemies come into this area. If there are two enemies in a region, fortunately just one comes in, so I guess having them be consolidated is not the end of the world, but we do likely want to try and defeat these enemies soon. The next part of this assault involves the Colossus. We find the two islands that are adjacent to it, and if they have any river regions on them, then they will deploy. We can see there are no rivers over here, but there are rivers up here. Uh, the river spot has golems. That means we're going to move one golem here, and then one golem will come down right over there. And that is going to finish out this assault. Now, just like I said before, as soon as we have all five of the different region types showing, this is the moment where we are going to collect all of these cards together and shuffle them back into this event deck. Now, at this moment, if the storm card did not come out, then everyone would be able to refresh their relics. However, the storm card did indeed come out. This means that effectively, once per overall shuffle, every player will get to refresh their uh, relic cards over here, uh, whether that is when the storm card comes out or once we've pulled all of these cards. So let's go ahead and shuffle all of this stuff back together, and we have now built the next event deck for the future. With that night phase over, we can now move into the blue player's day phase. With their first action, they have decided to move, which means they can actually go to two nodes instead of one, and they're going to go right here for one, and then right over there. Next up, I think it makes sense for the blue player to do a free machine activation, and they can use their refiner to defeat an enemy in this region, and these parasites are enemies. So that cleans it up from the board, and they can now use this as a wild crystal in the future. Now they can take their second action, and I think they should do a collection. Uh, they really would like to attack this region right here to defeat these enemies, and they currently don't have any blue crystals. There is one blue over here in the communal supply, and it is worth noting that they can spend uh, a pair of the same color crystal as if it was a different color. So they could just do this attack right now, even though they don't have any blue. They could use that communal blue as well as one of these pairs, or they could just do a collection to take three crystals and then discard one of them. Now, they do also have this parasite right here, so maybe, well, maybe they should do that. Uh, they don't really need these pinks anymore, and instead of discarding it, they could just be a little bit more action efficient. So, yeah, let's go ahead and have them not collect now. Let's just have them go right into the attack. 
As I just said, they don't really need these pink crystals right now. If they had collected, they likely would have discarded one of these anyway, so let's have them use both of these as a matching pair, which means they could act as any other color. In this case, they need to act as blue, and they can now draw the top arrow one command card. This unfortunately only has one strength on it, and we know that they have a golem and a troop in that area, so they would really like to get it to at least three. So let's have them draw another card. This will come from the Era 2 deck, and let's have them use the blue crystal from the communal pool in the middle. Um, those are there for a reason, and we had filled it up entirely, so we should probably uh, use these when it makes sense. So we can put this over here and draw the top of these Era 2 cards, and this is really good for us. It is three, so three plus one is going to be four, which means they should stop right now because they can use two out of the four to defeat this golem and then one of the two remaining to defeat this troop. And they have now eradicated everything and there is at least one strength left, so they do get an eradication bonus. Coming back down to the command cards they flipped over, we can see they could take a blue eradication bonus. This would allow them to take any one quom crystal of any color and give it to any player, not just themselves. The other option is the red one, which would destroy one troop from anywhere on the board. Now, it is certainly nice getting extra Quom Crystals, and we can give it to one of the other partners, but I don't think we really need to do that right now. We all have a decent amount of Crystals, and this communal pool is really helping us out as well. So let's go ahead and defeat one troop, and we'll get rid of this one up here. Uh, there were two in this region, so by getting rid of it, we are stopping another attack into this region, and then we can put this uh, troop down somewhere, and I think we'll just put it right back into the forest up here at this island. Next up, we have to respawn these two defeated enemies, and I think let's go with this island up here as well. There are just two golems up there, so we can slide this in right here, and then put this troop down over there, and this island is looking pretty full. At this point, the blue player has one action left, and they are now going to do a collect action. We can see they have just two crystals in their area, so they won't go over their maximum anymore. I think that worked out pretty well for them this turn. So they can now go ahead and take a pink, a brown, and a blue. But remember, their special ability means one of those three could be any color they want, and they don't really want a pink right now. So instead, they're going to take two brown and then just one blue. Actually, there are two brown already uh, out there in the middle of the board, so they will take two blue and then one brown, and that is going to finish out their turn. So let's now do the next night phase, and the card we drew is a Crystal Fields card. Now this is the first of those, which means we will do an assault for this terrain. So we can now find the inner matching region, and unfortunately that's right here because it is adjacent to three regions, all of which have these enemies in it. We were planning on having the yellow player eradicate this troop on their next turn using this machine right here, but it's a little bit too late because this troop is going to head in here, this troop will also head in here, and unfortunately this golem will head in here. Now with that, we have three enemies within this region, and that means one of these machines will be destroyed. All of the machines are currently here, which means the Harvester is going to be the first one to go. The next part of the assault involves the two islands next to the Colossus. We can see there is just one Crystal Fields area, so that is going to deploy, putting a troop right over here and a troop down over here. And unfortunately, as soon as that happens, we can see that there are now three enemies within this river region. That means one of these neutral buildings will get destroyed, and the main reason these are here is really just to absorb these attacks when three or more enemies go into a region. Obviously, uh, nobody can activate these. They are neutral, but once all three of them are gone, then future attacks will do five damage to the city. All right, the blue player's night turn is over, so yellow can go. And I think they should start off by doing an attack into this land of mist. There is just one Parasite over here, and it seems not great to use a whole action to get rid of it, but remember the yellow player can discard those Parasites as if they were two uh, crystals of any color, and getting these off means we will uh, take less damage when the Colossus moves. So we can see that this is a white region, and the yellow player just has one crystal, but they only need to get to one strength in order to defeat this Parasite. Now we are of course hoping that they hit a 2 or a 3 so that we can get an eradication bonus, and we got a 3. Now, realistically I think hitting a 2 would have been better, wasting a 3 on this Parasite is a bit of a bummer, but that is the one that we drew, uh, so that is going to take out that Parasite, which will then go into the yellow player's area, and we have 2 strength left over, which gives us an eradication bonus. We can see that they have just one option, which is the blue bonus, and that will allow them to take one color crystal of their choice and give it to any player. Well, I think the best thing for us to do is to give the yellow player a pink crystal because they are really close to this pink region that has three enemies in it, and uh, nobody else is closer, so yellow is probably going to be the one to take care of this. Next up, I think the yellow player should take a free action to activate one of their adjacent machines, and they're going to pick their scavenger. 
This will allow them to bring a fortification out, and they can put it right over here. And now for their second action, they can move. With this, they can go right here and then get a free bonus move, and they'll go right over here to the middle of the board. It's now time for their third action, and I think they should do a collect. Now, they're only going to get a pink and a brown, which is just two instead of the optimal three. But uh, if they had done a collection over here, they would not have picked up a pink, and they need these pink crystals in order to attack this region. There are three enemies right here kind of threatening to besiege the city, and we don't have any more pink in the communal pool. So getting these pink crystals is probably better than being more efficient with the number of crystals that they get for their actions. Yellow is done with their turn, so now we can do a night phase, and we have revealed a Land of Mist region card. This means we can do an assault on this because it is the first of those out, which means we can start by finding the Land of Mist inner region, and this is not too great for us. Uh, we can see that it is adjacent to three of these outer regions, and all three of them have some enemies in them. So this troop will come here, this golem will enter down here, and then this golem will enter over here because, again, when there are multiple options, you start with the golem first. Now, as soon as this golem reaches this land of mist, we now have three enemies over here, and that means they are going to destroy the red harvester machine. The second half of the assault involves these islands next to the Colossus, and unfortunately, both of these have lands of mist regions. So that means this one right here is going to deploy. Uh, one troop will go over here, and that will be the third of the enemies in this region. We can see there were two neutral buildings over here, and that means this neutral scavenger will be destroyed. We will also have a troop head down here, and that is the third enemy in this region, which is going to destroy this green harvester. Over here, we can see one troop will place down here, and that is an empty region, or it was at anyway before it came down. And this one will go over here, so things are a little bit less bad over here, but things are definitely starting to heat up. All right, it's time for the red player to go, and I think it's probably going to make sense for them to use their relic at some point on this turn. Again, that destroys one enemy from all of their adjacent regions when it is used. Well, now actually seems like a pretty good time for that. So let's flip this over as a free action. And right now we see that they are only adjacent to two regions, but that's fine. They can destroy this golem right here. And I think we should probably have them destroy this parasite. Uh, that is going to be two less damage we take when the Colossus inevitably moves. And they can now use this as a wild crystal in the future. Next up, they can respawn this golem, and we'll put them down into this island, and then they can take this parasite, and they are now at their limit. You cannot have more than two parasites, so it probably makes sense for the red player to try and use these soon. Red can now take their first main action of the turn, and I think it makes sense for them to move. They will get a bonus movement because they are doing this as their first action, so they could go one, two, and then use the bonus bump from this fortification to get them right over here. Once they do that, they can then do a free action to activate one of their two machines over here. They do have a refinery, so let's have them activate that and destroy this golem. We, of course, have to respawn it, and we'll just put it right back over here into this river section. And then they can go ahead and collect for their second action. That will get them a blue, a pink, and a white, so they can add those into their supply. And then for their third action, I figure they should attack this land of mist. That is a white area, and they are the Lone Rangers, so that means they start by pulling from this uh, Tier 3 command deck. So with the first of these crystals, they can flip this over, and they have done two strength worth of damage. Now, there is one golem and one troop, so that means they would really like to get to at least three. So let's have them spend another one of these white crystals, and that will draw a uh, Tier 2. So we can flip this over, and they got a three, so unfortunately they've kind of overkilled it once again. They only needed to do three strength, and they now have five total. So let's divvy out the strength points, and two will take care of this golem first, and then one will knock out this troop, and I figure let's just respawn them right over here. Uh, we can fill this into the Land of Mist area. I think that's a little bit scarier. Uh, they now have uh, two extra strength points, so the eradication bonus will come into effect. And with this, they can either move any character with the yellow bonus, or give a crystal of any color to one player with the blue one. At the moment, everybody's pretty stocked on crystals, so let's go ahead and do a bonus move, and we can have the yellow player go right over here. I think there's a lot more stuff going on in this part of the board, and the Colossus obviously is going to keep moving that away, so we do want them to be able to investigate the Colossus. Of course, we need to destroy this monster first, and we're hoping that the blue player will be able to do that on their next turn. Red is now done with their turn, so we can go into their night phase, and really quickly we have hit both of these Crystal Field region cards. That means we are going to do an invasion with those Crystal Fields. So every island with a Crystal Field on it will deploy from that region. Down here we can see that means that these two golems will come out. 
over here, there are just two of these troops left in that area. So this one will come down here, and unfortunately, that is the third enemy in that region. So that will destroy this green scavenger, and then this troop will come over here, becoming the third enemy in that region, and that will destroy the final of these neutral buildings in that river area. Uh, that means we should definitely do something about this soon. Uh, maybe the uh, red player should have done that on their last turn. I guess the besieging threat is also something to be concerned about. But in the future, if we have any more uh, troops go into here, so that it's three or more, we will take five damage. So uh, that's certainly something to keep in mind, especially considering this uh, crystal region is now empty. So if we have to deploy from it, we will once again take five damage to the city. All right, the blue player can now take their turn, and their main focus is destroying this monster so that we can once again continue to investigate the Colossus and try to win the game. Uh, so they're going to take their first action, which will be a movement. That will get them a bonus move, so they can go twice with that one action. And with their second action, they are going to attack this monster. Now, just like before, that means they can spend their crystals, either the blue, the brown, or the white. They currently have two blue, two white, and this uh, parasite right here in the middle, and they figure they'll start by using a blue. And we know that the target they're going for is six strength overall. So this first crystal is going to draw an arrow one card, and unfortunately it's a one. Let's go ahead and have them use one of these white crystals now, and that will come from the second arrow stack, and we got a three. So we are now at one plus three or four, so we would need a uh, two or better. Effectively, anything in this deck except for the ones, and they do exist in here, will allow this to be successful. So let's go ahead and push forward. I think let's have them use another blue, and that will pull from this three stack, and they found a five. So we have five plus three plus one, and that is going to be eight strength total, so that is definitely enough to defeat the Carolus. So we can remove it from the board, and we can get rid of this card, and the special effect for this monster is no longer in effect, and that one again did not allow us to investigate the Colossus, so investigation is definitely back on. We of course need to deal with all of these monsters out on the board, but the non-blue characters uh, or players uh, really need to keep focusing on that. Uh, hopefully the Colossus won't move soon, because the yellow player is in a pretty good position to try and make that happen on their next turn. Next up, we can take an eradication bonus because there were nine strength total, and we only used three of it. Now we have the yellow, blue, and red bonuses, so we can destroy a troop, uh, gain a crystal, or move a player. The blue player right now is pretty out of position. There's just a lot of enemies over here to attack, and they're way over here on the other side of the board, so let's have them go right over here. At this point, the blue player does have one action left, but before they take it, they will activate one of their machines. In this case, they will use their scavenger, and that will put one of their fortifications down, and they can put it right here, and after they do that, they can use their third action to move. They can then go here, and then as a bonus, get a free move due to the fortification, bringing them right here adjacent to the city, which is a pretty efficient spot in order to try and traverse to other parts of the board. Blue's turn is done, so let's do their night phase, and we have now found a water region. It is the first of those, so that means an assault is going to happen, and that's going to start right up here with this inner river region, and it appears that we've done a good job of clearing out all of these enemies. There are three adjacent regions and no enemies in any of them, so nothing will move over. And then we will once again come to the Colossus, who's been hanging out here for quite a while. I'm surprised they haven't moved just yet. And we can see these two islands are active again. There are no river regions on this island, but there is over here. Uh, there are five golems hanging out on this river region. So one will plunk down here, and one will go over here. And unfortunately, when this one enters this region, there is an attack because we have three or more enemies, and there are no more buildings. They all got wiped out pretty quickly there, uh, mostly because the Colossus was just sitting here, not moving. So since there are no buildings to destroy, that means the city is going to take five damage. So we will go from 70 down to 65, and then over here, when we have this golem enter, we have three or more enemies in the spot. So an attack happens, and that will clear out the final machine from that spot. So this is yet another location on the board where we will start taking more damage to the city when more enemies enter it. At this point, it's now the yellow player's turn, and even though we were kind of setting themselves up to try and take care of these enemies, I think we need to try and uh, investigate this Colossus while they are close. It's been a long time since we pulled one of those cards, so it really should be coming up soon, and the yellow player is in a position to guarantee a, a hit even if they pull a three out of one of these shards, and even if there is uh, one of those storm cards that come out, which means one of these enemies will besiege the city, well, we have five slots total and nothing has actually been taken, so if we take a little bit of damage over here, it's not the end of the world. The only way we win is by investigating the Colossus three more times, so let's do it. 
First of all, they do have to move two spaces, but fortunately they have not taken any actions yet. So their first action is a move, which gives them a bonus move to get them right over here. And then for their second action, they are going to go ahead and investigate. Just like before, that means we can grab any one of these shards, and we'll pull this one right from here. Uh, we have found a three, so that means we need to discard three pairs of brown and white crystals, or at least the yellow player does, in order to successfully investigate the Colossus. Now this is going to be expensive, but I think we can do it. We can see right over here that the yellow player has one brown, and there are two brown hanging out here in the middle, so that is the three brown that we need, but we also need three white. Now fortunately, they can discard this Parasite, and their special ability says that when they consume a Parasite, they get two crystals worth of a wild uh, color instead of the normal one. So this can turn into two of the white. They just need one more white, and with that, I think they will go ahead and get rid of both of these green. Again, if you discard a matching pair, it can act as any other color. So those two green will act as a white, and we have effectively gotten to our three pairs of brown and white, and the yellow player has successfully investigated the Colossus with this action. Since they were successful, that does mean they have to teleport back to one of the city nodes, and I figure we'll send them right over here. At this point, yellow does have one more action, but before they take it, let's have them use a free action of activating one of these adjacent machines. Now, in this case, I think let's have them use their scavenger to put this fortification down, and we'll put it right here. Having fortifications on the central ring, I think, is a good idea because this is a very efficient way to get around the map, and I think it's likely that a couple people might end up using this to go pretty far, and it's next to another fortification, so if we have to go really deep into this area, we could use that to go very far with our actions. So, yellow can now do their third and final action, and I think they should try to attack these monsters. There is a golem with two strength, and then two troops, so that is four strength total, and they currently have two of these pink crystals, so it is possible that they could get to four strength with those two, so let's have them start by spending one of them, which means they can draw from the arrow one deck, and they found a one, so that's not a great start, but now we've uh, kind of committed to it. Let's have them spend their other crystal and they can draw from the two deck and they found a two. So that means they have three strength total. And unfortunately, there's no way for them to get any more pink crystals. We don't have any more here in the central area, so they do have to stop drawing cards. Now they can start divvying up the strength and they always have to hit the golems first if they are there. So this golem will take two out of the three and then the last one will take out this troop. But unfortunately, there is still one troop remaining in that region. Next up, the yellow player does have to respawn these enemies, and I figure we'll put them down onto this island. I really don't like the idea of this crystal field being empty, although if you ever have to deploy from a field, you have to obviously pull two out, and if you don't have enough, then you take five damage, whether it's one or zero that you are missing. So by putting this one here, we are not stopping ourselves from taking extra damage if the crystal fields get hit soon, but I guess when we consider the fact that both of those cards have come out, it will be a little while, so we should probably uh, continue to fill this up. Uh, we got one there, and we'll probably get another one over there relatively soon, at least hopefully before the next Next shuffle. Yellow's turn is done, so they can go into the night phase, and we have finally found a Colossus card. It's been quite a while since we've pulled one of these, so now uh, the first thing that happens is we are going to have a couple parasites get spawned, and those will be placed into the regions adjacent to the Colossus. Now one will go over here, but unfortunately another one will go down there, and that is another enemy entering this region, and we can see that there are three or more enemies, so another machine will get destroyed, but all of them are gone, so instead we will take five more damage to the city. So we were at 65, and now we're down to 60, and we're starting to close in on the halfway mark with our health, and considering the Colossus is about to attack, that is something I'm starting to get concerned about. Speaking of that attack, it's now time to go through with it. The Colossus will activate all of the Parasites, but we've done a pretty good job of cleaning those up. There are just the two that came out, so that will do four damage to the city, and that will bring it from 60 down to 56. And then the allies of the Colossus will fight, but we've done a good job of fighting off those monsters. We've killed all of them at this point, so we won't take any more damage. So I guess uh, last time uh, the Colossus moved, we took 19 damage, and this time we just took two. So I'm uh, maybe a little less concerned than I was a few seconds ago, and overall I think that worked out pretty well for us. Next up, it's time for the Colossus to move, however, I need to fix something real quick. 
Now, whenever we deal out one of each of the land types and we reshuffle that event deck, one thing we are supposed to do is take all of these revealed shards and put them back here into the bag. So I should have done that before. It didn't really matter, I suppose, overall. So we can now shuffle these back in. And now the Colossus will move. And this shard we just pulled out has a two on it. So it seems like the Colossus does really like moving two in this game. Uh, we aren't going to pull any ones because we've seen both of those already. But it is likely there are threes knocking around in here as well. So the Colossus picks up and moves one, two over to this location here. The night phase is over, so now the red player can go. And I think they really need to do something about these hordes of monsters over here. We're going to start taking a lot more damage as they keep uh, spawning into these two regions. Now, before the red player takes any main actions, though, I think they should do a free action to activate one of their uh, red machines, because they are right next to it. And unfortunately, they don't have any harvesters anymore that got destroyed, so they cannot harvest one of those clear crystals. But they can use this scavenger to put another fortification out. In a three-player game, each person has three of these fortifications, and this has to go adjacent to this region, so we can put that right over here. And I'm not particularly using, uh, planning on using it this round, but we now have a couple of these next to each other, so we can be a lot faster about zipping around this ring to get from one side of the board to the other. Next up, Red can now take their first action, and I think they should move. This gives them a free move, although they don't really need it. They can go right here and use this fortification to go right over here, and this is a pretty good spot to hit both of these regions. Now, at this point, they could do a gather action to pull up three crystals, or they could go right into attacking. And I think the second option is probably what they should do because they can potentially attack both of these regions this turn. Uh, let's go ahead and have them start over here because they can start using their parasites. And then hopefully if things go well, they can pick up another parasite to use into the other region, either this turn or on the next turn. Uh, you can't hold more than two parasites, so they should start by using these. So they will begin by using one to consume it as if it was brown to attack this area. And we can see that there is a golem, three troops, and one parasite site, which means there is effectively six strength worth of enemies here, so we're hoping to get to that with this attack. Under normal circumstances, I would be more worried about that with the amount of crystals the red player has, but they are the lone ranger, which means they do get to start on the three pile here. So hopefully they'll hit like a four or a five, and they got a four. That's great. We only needed to get to six, and we are already four on the way there. We now, I'm feeling somewhat confident this will be successful. So the question really is, do we want to spend another parasite, or do we want to spend two of our pink crystals as if it was a wild? Now, considering we are about to get another Parasite, let's go ahead and use the second one that we have. So we can put that here and draw another Era 2 card. And we found a 1. That is really unfortunate, actually. Uh, that's 4 plus 1 is 5, and we needed to get to 6 in order to fully wipe out everything and pick up that last Parasite. Now, this is certainly a bummer, but I think let's go ahead and keep pushing forward. At the bare minimum, by spending these two pink as if they were brown, we will definitely clear everything out and pick up another Parasite, and it's somewhat likely we'll hit a two or a three, which will give us an eradication bonus. So let's draw this third card right here, and we hit a three, so we are definitely overkilling now. Unfortunately, that's going to be four plus uh, one plus three, so that's eight strength total which we can then start using in this region. So from eight, we remove two, so we're at six, then five, four, three, and two, and we have eradicated everything from the region with two strength left over, which is going to give us an eradication bonus, and of course, we get to pick up this parasite as well. So let's look at our eradication bonus options. We have two reds and a blue, so we can either destroy one troop or gain one crystal to give to one player. Now, destroying troops is nice, but if we give a blue crystal to the red player right now, well, they could use that on their next action to try and eradicate all of these because with this parasite, they effectively have three crystals, which is the maximum you can use when you are attacking. So I think that is definitely the right call at this point. And then we, of course, have to respawn all of these enemies, and they all have to go into the same island. Now, I think we should definitely respawn over here because we want to fill in these uh, crystal fields because this is the most vulnerable region of the board. We uh, really don't want this to keep being emptied out. So we can put all of these over here or maybe three over there and let's put one over here into the mist area. And then unfortunately, we do have to put this golem over there. So we have a bit of a golem convention going on on this island. Well, the red player can now take a third action. And as I just mentioned, we kind of set themselves up well to do another attack. So let's go through with it. This is a blue region, and they have two blue as well as one parasite. So they can start off by spending a blue. 
And before we go down there, let's take a look at the region, and we see there is uh, three troops and one golem, so that is five strength worth of enemies we want to defeat. This is once again an attack from the Lone Ranger, so they get to start from the three stack instead of the one stack for the other players, and it appears they found a three. Now we are looking for five strength total, so let's have them spend another of their blue crystals. They can now draw from the second stack, and they found two. So that is going to be five exactly, and I don't think we should spend our uh, Parasite to gain more in order to get an eradication bonus. I always like getting those bonuses, but I think we should save it and just stop here. So let's divvy out the five strength, and the first two has to get rid of this golem. We now have three left, and with that three, we can take all of these troops off of the board. And the red player has had a great turn. They emptied both of these regions out, so there's a little bit less stress going on here as far as us taking damage to the city. Obviously, this will eventually build back up again, but in the short run, I think we can give this area less priority. Next up, we have to respawn all of these enemies, and I figure let's choose this island. It's right next to the Colossus, so uh, if we have some more assaults, in particular from the brown area, uh, we might start to kind of have these get emptied out. Uh, this does mean we have five of these golems over here, but I'm kind of worried about filling in these troops. So we can add that one right there, and then we can kind of split these two out. So we have five in both of these regions, and this island is looking pretty well stocked. So the red player's very productive turn is over, and we can now go into the night phase, and we have pulled the first of the mountain region cards. That means we will perform an assault in those regions. We have to start with this inner mountain region, and that is going to pull one enemy in from each of these adjacent outer regions, and that means both of these golems will enter this spot. Next up, we will have an assault from the islands that are adjacent to the Colossus, and unfortunately, both of them do have a mountain area. So that means two of these troops will come out, one into each of these areas, and then over here, two of these golems will come out, one into each of those adjacent spots. Okay, the red player's turn is officially done, so blue can go, and I suppose it's worth noting that we were pretty flush with crystals just a couple turns ago, and now we've done a very good job of spending almost all of them. Well, to start things off, the blue player is going to use their free action to activate their relic, and that will get them three crystals of their choice. And I figure let's give them two brown and one green. After they've done that, they can now take their first action, and let's go ahead and have them just start working on these enemies in this brown area. They now have three brown crystals, so they are uh, well suited to handle this. And there are just two golems in this area, so that is four strength worth of enemies. So they can start off by spending one brown crystal. And with this, they can draw the top arrow one command card, and they hit a three already, so uh, this is a very good start for them. Uh, now they do want to get to four or more, so they will spend another one of these, and that will draw a level two card, and they found a one. So they are now at exactly what they wanted to be at, and the question is, do they want to spend their last of these uh, crystals in order to guarantee an eradication bonus? Now with that bonus, they could either destroy a troop or they could move one of the uh, uh, golems or troops out on the map. And I don't think that makes sense. Let's have them keep this crystal for now. So they won't get a bonus, but they do have four strength total. And that is exactly enough to defeat both golems in this mountain area. Next up, they do have to respawn these golems onto the same island. And this one way up here just has one golem on it. So I think that is a great spot to put them down into. Blue can now take their second action, and they want to deposit crystals. They currently have three in their area, and we have three open spots in the uh, city here. So let's put all of these out so that their uh, partners can also make use of these. And the blue player does now have one more action. And they figure they should just do a move. They can go right here onto this fortification, which gives them a bonus move. That will bring them right over there, and they have now finished out their main actions, but they can uh, do a free action to activate one of their machines, and they will activate their refinery right here to destroy one enemy, and that will be this one troop right here. Next up, they do have to respawn this troop, and let's just put it right down over here. Okay, blue is done with her turn, so we can do the night phase, and we hit the storm card again. Uh, there's just one of them in this deck that has 14 cards total, and this is going to summon another monster. So we could draw the top monster card, and we have found Onigaras. Now this one has nine strength. I think that is the highest out of all of them, and it is going to spawn onto the volcano island. 
and we can see that that's going to be the island with the pink, green, and blue on it. So that's right over here, and this is a pretty big miniature. We can put that right here in the middle, and the special effect for this monster is while it is in play, nobody can gain any eradication bonuses. So uh, this is kind of hard to kill at 9 strength. It's going to hit the city pretty hard when the Colossus moves, and those eradication bonuses were really nice as we kind of overkilled the enemies, and we won't have access to it while this monster is alive. The next part of the storm involves the city potentially being besieged, and that means that every one of the five adjacent inner regions will send one enemy in if they have at least one. Now, fortunately, just one region does have an enemy. Uh, this is a troop that just barely survived the yellow player's attack on, I think, their last turn. So now it will uh, lay siege to the city, and we can put it right down over here. Now, if there were any empty spots, we would just put the troop into that, but since we had crystals on all of them, we could put it right down here, and we will lose access to this crystal, and it's worth noting, again, that there is no way to remove this enemy from the city, so for the rest of the game, we can only store a maximum of four crystals in our shared pool, and if uh, we get five more enemies over here, this uh, would lose us the game, although right now, it's not looking like that's likely to happen anytime soon. The last part of the storm is beneficial for us. This is going to recharge all of our relics, so we can once again use those abilities. Alright, the yellow player can now take their day phase. Now there are a few things that the yellow player could do. They are in this neck of the woods right now, and they could potentially come over here and maybe collect some resources and then try to wipe out these enemies. They could pick up one of these parasites, which again is worth two wild resources for them, so that's pretty good for them. But I think maybe what we should do instead is head all the way over here and try to investigate the Colossus. I don't think there is a way to guarantee them the ability to have three brown and three green available to them, but they could get to two brown and two green, and it's very likely that that is the number on one or both of those shards on the Colossus. Worst case scenario, if we go over there and we miss, and maybe the Colossus moves away, well, if the Colossus moves, they'll drop two parasites and the yellow player will be over there already. So with that in mind, let's make great use of these fortifications, and we can do a move with the yellow player to start things off. Since this is their first action, they get two movement, and the first one will bring them here, which will give them a bonus movement to here, which will give them a bonus movement all the way to here, and of course they have one more movement because this is their first action, so they can now go right over here, and they are already adjacent, just one road away from the Colossus, with just one really long move there. Next up, they should definitely collect resources. This means they get to take a green, a brown, and a blue. And of course, the green and brown will help them with their impending investigation. Speaking of which, I think it's time for yellow to go for it. So that means they can pick up the Colossus figurine and choose one of the shards, and we'll go with this one here. So let's look at the number, and it is a two, and that means we just need two green and two brown in order to be successful. And if we back out here, we can see they have one green over here and one green on the central communal supply, and they have one brown, and there is a brown out here. So it, it turns out the crystals that the blue player put over into the city on the last turn were uh, crucial for this. So that is two pairs, and that means the uh, yellow player has successfully investigated the Colossus twice. Now there is just one shard remaining on the Colossus, and I think odds are pretty good that it's going to be a three. And remember, you can only win the game if every shard is is uh, investigated and if every one of the players has done at least one investigation. That means at this point, in order for us to win the game, we need the uh, red player to get the resources available that they need and head over to investigate this Colossus. That is our only win condition and it's starting to get within our grasp. Because they were successful, the yellow player now has to finish out this investigation by going back to one of these central nodes, and they're going to go right over here, and that's going to put them right next to some of their machines, so they can do a free action with them. After looking at their options, they're going to activate their harvester, and that is going to give them one crystal of the region's color, so that means they get to take one green. And then they've decided to use their other free action to exhaust their relic, and their special ability allows them to put up to three of their crystals into the city. It's essentially a free deposit action from anywhere on the board. So they can put these right over here, and they are now done with their turn. This means we can now go into the night phase, and we found another Colossus card. If you remember, there are three of these in this deck of 14 cards, and that means the Colossus will now spawn parasites. These will go down into the adjacent regions to the Colossus, and then it will attack by activating all of the Parasites, which will all do two damage each. Now at the moment, there are one, two, three Parasites on the board, so that is six damage total. The defense of the city is currently at 56, so that is going to bring it down to 50. 
and then the Colossus will call upon their allies with these monsters, and all of them will attack equal to their strength. Fortunately, there is just one monster right now, but it is a big one. It is going to do 9 damage to the city, so it's going to go from 50 down to 41 health. Lastly, the Colossus is going to move, so we can pull a shard from the bag, and the one we found is another 2. It seems like the Colossus can only move 2 this game. At this point, we have yet to pull a 3 out. So, let's pick it up, and it will now go 1, 2, down to this location at the bottom of the board. The night phase is over, so the red player can now go, and the main focus, I think, for the red player for the rest of the game is trying to investigate the Colossus, because once they do it, we will win. Now at this moment, there's no way to tell how long the Colossus will hang out down here. We have pulled two out of the three Colossus cards in that deck, but we could pull the next one with the next night phase. So I think let's just go ahead and play, assuming the Colossus will not be moving. And right now, the Colossus is next to a blue and a green region, and we currently have two green and a blue uh, crystal in the communal supply. So it's a really good spot for us to try and get this final investigation in. So let's start moving over there, and since this is the first action of the red player's turn, they get two movement with this. Now with the first of these two, they will go here, but they now get a bonus for the fortification, which will get them to here, which gives them a bonus bringing them to here, and once again, you cannot stay where an opponent is, so that gives them yet another free movement bonus, bringing them to this spot, and then they can use their second movement with this bonus first action to bring them all the way down here. So that was a pretty strange little path there for just one action. Next up, let's have them use their free Relic action, and that ability allows them to defeat one enemy from every adjacent region. Currently, two out of those three regions do have enemies, so they can defeat this troop, and they can defeat this Parasite, and that will definitely help because it is effectively a Wild Crystal for the purposes of investigating the Colossus. We do now have to put this troop down somewhere, and I figure we'll put it into this mountain region here. And then let's have the red player do another free action to activate one of their adjacent machines. We can see all three of them are still deployed in this area, so let's use the refinery in order to kick out this troop. And then let's go ahead and respawn it down here into this forest area. For the red player's second action, let's have them move right over here. And for their third action, let's try to investigate the Colossus. Right now, we could get up to a 2 value, and if this is a 2, then we just win the game. If it's a 3, then we've effectively uh, wasted one of our actions, but I think this is going to be worth it. Now, we know that the red player has these two parasites, and we have this blue and the two green in the middle. So uh, we could use these as a combination to get to the two blue and the two green. But let's now go ahead and see what the final shard is, and it is a 3. All right, so we cannot get to 3, unfortunately. We're just one crystal away from making that happen. But we now know about this, so we can just stay right over here, and we will certainly win the game if the Colossus does not move by the time the red player has another turn. I suppose I should say that that's only going to be the case if we don't end up losing before the red player's next turn, but let's go ahead and see what happens. I think it is somewhat possible the Colossus will move before they go. Now we can go into the night phase for the red player, and they have pulled out another one of these Land of Mist regions. We do already have one of them right here, and that means we will have an invasion from the Land of Mist regions on the islands. We can start right down here, which will bring two troops out onto the board. Right over here, we will have two more troops come out. And then over here, two of these golems will come out. Now, when this one lands, it is now the third of the enemies in that area. So that is going to destroy one of these machines. But then down here, we're looking pretty okay. That's just the first enemy in that zone. All right, the blue player can now go. And they've decided to start off with a free action to activate one of their adjacent machines. They can bring their refinery online, and that will defeat this golem right here. They, of course, have to spawn this back onto the map, and we'll put it over here. Next up, the blue player can take their first main action, and I think they should move. Since this is the first action of their turn, they do get to move twice. And the first move will bring them to this fortification, and that's going to give them a bonus, bringing them to here. And then let's have them move one more over here. Now, at this point, they have two more actions, and I want to talk a little bit about how we want to plan for the next couple turns. Obviously, we win if the red player is able to uh, investigate the Colossus, and if the Colossus moves, we know it will go either two or three spaces around the board because we have already revealed both of the uh, one value shards. Now, if the Colossus moves twice, it will go over to that corner, and if it moves three times, it will go one, two, three over to there. Now, the best thing for us is to plan ahead, and if the Colossus does move, we want to put ourselves in a position where we could still win on the red player's next turn. 
Now, in order for the red player to be able to investigate in either of these spots, one of their three actions will have to be collecting. And what that means is the red player would need to get to either this spot right here or that spot with just one action. Now, if they move as their first action, they could go twice. And we really need to position the other players in such a way to be able to get the red player over. Now, we can see right now that for just one move, the red player could go all the way over to that spot, which means we effectively are overkill on this area. But if red wants to get here, that is going to be one, two, three moves. Now, that is going to eat up two of the overall actions. And again, one action needs to be moving, one needs to be collecting, and one needs to be investigating. Now, with that in mind, I think the blue player should stay here, and on the yellow player's turn, we could have them end their turn right over here, and that way, on the red player's turn, they could potentially go all the way through the yellow player to here for one move, and then get over here for the second one with their first action. Uh, if the yellow player is over there, the red player could still go one, two, and get over there, so I think we would be covering all of our bases. Now, it's the blue player's turn right now, but we want to kind of talk out all these options to figure out how to kind of solve the puzzle so that we can get our ourselves in a winning position and with that in mind I think the blue player does not need to move anymore so for their next two actions I figure let's have them collect now they can take a pink and a brown of course they can change what those are in each one of those gatherings but realistically we don't super care what crystals the uh, blue player gets right now because I think we're setting ourselves up for a pretty solid win here but either way let's just take two pink and two brown and then we can move into the night phase now before we draw this card, we can look out to all the ones face up, and it looks like the only region we are currently missing is forest. So if that is revealed, then we will recreate the uh, deck, and we have found water. Okay, so that is not going to be the case. We can put this right over here. That is the second of the water regions, and that means we are going to have an invasion from those water regions on the islands. Looking out to the map, we can see the first invasion is going to come from this island right over here. The second invasion will come from here. These are golems, and now each of these regions has two of these enemies in it. If it was three, then each one would actually deal five damage to the capital, but right now things are looking pretty okay over there. Two is just fine. And then finally, we have the last water region over here. This uh, little uh, troop will go down here, and this one will enter up here, and that does mean an attack will happen because there are three or more enemies in the spot. So this yellow scavenger will be destroyed. And that's going to finish out the night phase, so now the yellow player can take their turn. Now yellow has three actions available to them, and we know that they have to end their turn either right here or right here in order to guarantee that the red player will be able to get over to the Colossus if the Colossus moves. Now that does give the yellow player some leeway with what they can do with their turn. I figure the first thing they can do is just activate this yellow harvester. That is going to give them a green crystal because this is a forest, so they can add that into their supply. And then for their first out of three actions, they will move. They have two movement available, but they just need one. They could go all the way over to here due to those fortifications. And then with their second action, they can collect. Looks like they will get a brown as well as a white and a blue. And for their third action, they figure they will attack this region using this brown crystal. And then they can draw from the first stack here, and they got two strength. And that is all they can do. They just had the one brown, so they can now deal two damage into that region. And it looks like there is a golem and a parasite, but you always have to hit the golems first, so they will defeat it with those two damage. And then they have to respawn it, and they'll put it right over here. Okay, it's time for the night phase, and currently there are just four cards left in the deck. One of them is a Colossus card, so we have a 25% chance of it moving, and it is! <laughs> All right. Well, first things first, we will have two Parasites get spawned out, and we don't have three or more enemies in either of these regions, and now the Colossus will attack. Currently there are one, two, three, four parasites on the board. Each one does two damage, so that is going to be eight damage total. We can see right now the city is at 41 health, so this is going to bring it down to 33. And then the Colossus will call upon their allies, and currently there is just one monster, and that will deal nine damage to the city. So we are going to go from 33 down to 24. And then it's time for the Colossus to move, and I'm curious to see if it's going to move more than two for the first time in the game, and it's not. <laughs> Looks like there were definitely three twos there in the bag, which means the Colossus will go one, two, and stop in this corner. 
All right, it's time for the red player to take their day phase, and I think they can end the game. For the first action, they are going to move. This will give them two movement because they get that bonus for this being the first action. The first move will get them all the way over to here because they get a bonus from this fortification and from this other player. And then the second move will get them through both of these fortifications and get them right over here. So it seems like these being right next to each other did indeed help us out here at the end. After that, I think red should gather. We can see they are next to pink, blue, and white, so they can pick those out of the bowl and add them into their own supply. And then for the red player's third action, they should investigate. Now we know what this shard is going to be because we already pulled it out before. It has a three on it, which means we need to get three pink and three blue. Now at the moment, we can look over here and we have one pink and one blue. In the shared pool in the middle, we have another blue, so that gets us to two. And then we also have these two parasites over here. Now we can use one parasite to be the third blue, and then another parasite can be a pink. And then at this point, we need just one more pink in order to win. And we could do that by either turning in these two greens or these two whites over here. So looks like we were more than covered, actually. We'll get rid of both of these greens as if they were pink. And we have successfully had the red player investigate the Colossus. And with that, we have won the game. We can see that all five of the primal shards have been investigated, and every single player has done at least one of those investigations. Uh, we were not super close to losing with the health of the city overall. I guess we were at 24, so that was starting to get uh, on the low side of things. But either way, we are victorious, and that completes one full three-player game of Mysthea the Fall. Well, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough. Overall, I think it did a pretty good job of showing off the various mechanics to this game, as well as the arc of the game, where you have a board that's relatively clear at the beginning of the game, and you have players that are very action inefficient, trying to wander around as much as they can and really take care of these enemies and also get the crystals they need. But also, as you go farther into the game, you have players being able to uh, really use the position of their partners to get extra movement, and then more importantly, able to use their scavenger machines to put those fortifications down into the right locations. So you can create these super highways to be really action efficient near the middle and later stages of the game to get all the way across the map for um, just one or two actions. Now, in terms of this play itself, it uh, obviously wasn't that close at the end. Uh, I guess the overall health of the city was down to the 24% uh, uh, level, but we were able to wrap this up one up pretty well, and I think that a big part of that has to do with us getting a little bit lucky with the shards. Now, you can play this game at an easy, a normal, or a hard difficulty, and we played it at normal, but we had it pretty, uh, the easy side of normal because both of the level one shards that are in a normal game were put into the Colossus. Now that means we had to spend less crystals to actually investigate the Colossus, so we had more crystals available to fight back all of the enemies, but it also means that the Colossus could never move once out on the map. Now that's important because usually uh, when you pull out those uh, region cards, um, it's, they're very uh, Colossus location dependent. You know, if it's the first of that region type, then the islands next to the Colossus will send out those enemies. Now if the Colossus moves just one once, then that means it is in a new spot and it probably won't move again for a little bit and it will continue to send out enemies from that island it just jumped over because it got kind of essentially summoned when the Colossus is here and then when it's right there. Now in this playthrough, the Colossus could only ever move two or three because all of the ones were not in the bag. And that means when the Colossus moved, it always went away from both of the islands it was summoning enemies away from. And I think that is the main reason why we never really got to the point where we were worried about an island being completely cleared off because obviously that is one of the end game conditions. And we even didn't get to the point where we had to summon some troops or golems and we didn't have enough. Obviously you take five damage to the city when that happens, but I think that was just another uh, fortuitous uh, uh, happenstance that came from the fact that the ones were over on the Colossus. Now, obviously, we didn't know that at the beginning of the game, and I think that we played the game uh, pretty well, really utilizing the special abilities of the Seekers and the Champions. Uh, you had the Lone uh, Ranger, who was really good at wiping out those monsters, as well as lots of enemies. Uh, the Lone Ranger killed a lot of different enemies in this game, uh, but then you also had the other two that really synergized well as, uh, as well. You had that champion that could be flexible with the crystals they got, and they could just get crystals when they needed it, um, occasionally when they had their relic available. And then you have the yellow player who can, a couple times throughout the game, just dump a bunch of crystals into that communal pool so their partners could use those crystals and they could really uh, very well utilize the parasites in order to get extra wild crystals, which are very good for investigating that Colossus. So overall, I think we did a good job of really combining all of the abilities of those champions and seekers. We got a little bit lucky with the way the shards went, and I think this was a pretty good showing for how Mystia the Fall works. And I think at this point, that's going to wrap up all my thoughts on it. 
As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.